Welcome back. The next application of screening tests that we'll look at will be to pap smear screening for cervical cancer. And so we imagine that uh, a woman goes to her physician to be tested for cervical cancer or screened for cervical cancer. And so the question is, you know, how might the physician uh, set up uh, the decision making process? Now, this would obviously be determined by the standard of care uh, in that particular field, but let's just imagine as a decision-making situation um, how we might, how one might consider uh, setting up the hypotheses. And so there are two ways that we could set up the hypotheses uh, corresponding to this decision-making scenario. The first would be to assume uh, as the null hypothesis that the woman does have cervical cancer uh, and then the alternative would be the opposite of that, that the woman does not have cervical cancer. And so uh, with this first setup, uh, the physician is assuming the patient who walks in the uh, uh, office does have cervical cancer and uh, the physician is going to let the data through the screening test uh, try to convince him or her otherwise. Now the other way of setting this up would be that the null hypothesis is that the woman does not have cervical cancer and the alternative would be the opposite of that, which uh, is that the woman does have cervical cancer. And so this would be uh, a situation where the physician uh, assumes that his patient does not have cervical cancer and then lay, lets the screening test uh, guide his decision making to see uh, if uh, the alternative is true. And so again, the question is, does it matter how we set these up? If not, why not? And if so, uh, why does it matter and how does it matter? And again, in order to answer that question, we would need to think about uh, if for each of these ways of setting up the hypotheses, uh, what is a type 1 error, what is a type 2 error, and then what are the relative costs associated which, with each of those types of inferential errors. Now, we're going to set up the hypotheses in uh, the following way. The null hypothesis is that the woman does not have cervical cancer, and then uh, the alternative would be that uh, the woman does have cervical cancer. And so again, the physician is assuming uh, that uh, her patient does not have cervical cancer, but will let the data uh, through the screening test uh, guide her and try to uh, indicate to her if that's in fact not the case. And so with that particular setup, uh, what is a type 1 error? What is a type 2 error? What are the relative losses or costs associated with uh, these two types of infer inferential errors? And which would you uh, consider to be worse, a type 1 error or a type 2 error? And so with this setup, uh, a type 1 error would be concluding that a woman does have cervical cancer when in fact she does not. Now, the cost associated with uh, a type 1 error would be uh, more invasive and costly testing performed, perhaps even uh, surgery or cancer treatment. Uh, a type 2 error would be concluding that a woman does not have cervical cancer when in fact she does. Now, the cost or loss associated with that would be no additional follow-up testing is done at that time. Uh, the cancer remains, uh, continues to grow, and perhaps even spreads. So that would be, you know, a very uh, bad situation uh, as well. So, you know, you, what I, the question I'm asking here is, you know, we, once we've identified what the two types of errors are and identified uh, potential costs associated uh, with those errors, and there are uh, perhaps even uh, other uh, costs associated as well, or when we say cost, we, you know, are really talking about undesirable outcomes, right? Uh, associated with uh, these different kinds of uh, undesirable outcomes, there are costs, and those costs vary. So my, the question to you, as you ponder this situation, 
uh, which type of inferential error would you consider to be worse and therefore to be more guarded against or protected from in this situation? Now, with that in mind, right, once you've made that determination, uh, would you recommend using a smaller value of, of alpha, the significance level, or a larger level of significance? Remember that alpha is the probability of a type 1 error. Beta is the probability of a type 2 error. Remember that alpha and beta are inversely related. So if you considered uh, a type 1 error to be uh, worse than a type 2 error in this situation, then you may want to use a smaller uh, significance level right, to reduce the probability of a type 1 error. But you need to ke uh, keep in mind that by reducing the probability of a type 2 error, you are necessarily increasing the probability of a type 2 error. On the other hand, if you considered a type 2 error to be worse, then uh, you may want to uh, choose to have uh, to try to do what you can to decrease the probability of a type 2 error. In other words, trying to decrease beta. Now, you'll remember that we don't have direct control over beta. Uh, we have direct control uh, over alpha. And so if we wanted to make beta small, if we wanted to make the probability of a type 2 error small then, or smaller, then we would have to uh, uh, use a larger level of significance. We would need to use a larger uh, alpha, uh, or in other words, a larger probability for a type 1 error. And so you see we've got, uh, there's this balance that we have to consider, all right, because of this inverse relationship between alpha and beta. Okay, so let's look at some real world numbers uh, for this kind of uh, situation. This is a this is a real world uh, scenario, right? There are real data. We're not going to be using made up data in this particular example, all right? We're going to be using uh, and discussing uh, actual uh, uh, Pap smear type of tests or, or information in, uh, regarding pap smear tests, as well as uh, real-world uh, prevalence information. And so let's first talk about the accuracy of the pap smear screening test. Now, let me preface this by saying that uh, this, like I said, this is real-world information. Uh, the source for this information comes from a published paper uh, it was published in 2018 in the Indian Journal of Gynecolog uh, Gynecological uh, Oncology, uh, the link of which is given here. All right, so you could look this up if you'd like. The title of the paper was Evaluation of Sensitivity and Specificity of Pap Smear, LBC, and HPV in Screening of Cervical Cancer. And so based on this study, uh, this published study, the sensitivity of the pap smear test, all right, which is used all across the world. Again, the sensitivity is the probability that the pap smear test comes back positive when it's applied to somebody that does have cervical cancer. So if somebody has cervical cancer, what is the probability that the test indicates that they have uh, cervical cancer? That probability is 0.7580. So that is the sensitivity of the pap smear test that is used all over the world. The specificity of the pap smear test, which again is the uh, conditional probability that the test comes back negative given or for those people who don't have cervical cancer. So that probability is 0 0.9805. So if somebody does not have cervical cancer, the probability that the pap smear test comes back negative is 0 0.9805. If a person does have cervical cancer, then the probability that the test comes back positive is 0 0.7580. And so what these values indicate in particular, what the sensitivity indicates is that only about 75 or 76 percent of the women who have cervical cancer would be identified by the pap smear test as having cervical cancer. Now, remember that we've set up our hypotheses uh, in the following way. 
The null hypothesis is that the woman does not have cervical cancer. The alternative hypothesis is that the woman does have cervical cancer. And so uh, the assumption is going into it that the woman does not have cervical cancer, but then the physician gives the screening test uh, the opportunity to inform uh, her or his decision regarding whether or not the patient actually does have cervical cancer. Now, as in the previous example that we looked at in the previous lecture video, the significance level for this test is baked into uh, the test through the characteristics of the screening test, which again is, uh, these characteristics are given here. And remember, we were considering what a type one error uh, represents, what a type two error represents, uh, the type one error being concluding that a woman does have cervical cancer when in fact she does not, the cost of that, uh, you know, what would happen if that were the case? If, if uh, the, uh, the doctor concluded that the woman does have cervical cancer uh, when in fact she does not, well, the cost of that is uh, more invasive and costly testing performed, perhaps even cancer treatment. Um, on the other hand, a type two error would be concluding that the woman does not have cervical cancer when in fact she does. And that's a very uh, undesirable situation because in that type of situation, there would be no additional follow-up testing uh, at that time. Cancer, the cancer remains, continues to grow, perhaps even spreads. And so that would be an, a very undesirable uh, situation. And so we asked ourselves the question, which of these two types of infer inferential errors would we consider to be worse and therefore to be more guarded against? And with that in mind, uh, would we want to use a smaller or a larger value of significance? In other words, a larger or smaller uh, value of alpha. Remember that alpha is the probability of a type 1 error. Beta is the probability of a type 2 error. So would you want to use a larger alpha? Uh, in, in hopes of reducing the probability of a type two error, or would you want to use a smaller alpha in order to uh, help guard against the type one error? So, you know, be thinking about that uh, as we uh, look at these values, but remember that the actual alpha, the significance level of the test, in this situation, we cannot actually choose it because it's baked into uh, the, uh, baked into the accuracy characteristics of the test, uh, in particular uh, the uh, threshold that is being used in the pap smear which uh, uh, determines the sensitivity and the specificity for the test. Now the significance level of the test is uh, again equal to the false positive rate of the pap smear test and therefore can be obtained from the specificity of the test. Okay and so Based on uh, this pap smear test, this, this single uh, test, uh, the significance level of the test uh, is 0 0.0195. Okay, so let's take that value, 0 0.0195, and come back up here and again consider, all right, what's happening here. Uh, that is a fairly small significance level, a fairly small alpha, which tends to guard against uh, uh, this type of uh, situation, all right? Concluding that a woman uh, does have cervical cancer when in fact uh, she does not. But by using a smaller significance level, a smaller probability for a type one error, that is increasing beta, which is the probability of a type two error. So. Uh, based on the characteristics of the test, which determine that significance level, that's resulting in a larger probability that a woman, or the larger probability of a type two error, which uh, corresponds to concluding that a woman does not have cervical cancer when in fact she does. All right, now let's look at the prevalence of cervical cancer in uh, the general population. And so uh, what we're looking at here, uh, the prevalence of 13 year limited duration uh, for women who are 20 to 29 years of age. All right, so instead of looking at the entire population uh, 
of all women, we're looking at a very a specific uh, uh, subpopulation, those uh, women that are 20 to 29 years of age. All right, so uh, the prevalence values within that population, uh, we've got breakdowns uh, by race and overall. All right, and uh, by the way, these data, these are real world data. Uh, these are not made up. These come from the uh, United States Cancer Statistics uh, website uh, on the CDC website. And so uh, for all uh, races combined, uh, the prevalence is 0.0093%. All right, so that is an actual percentage. The actual, the, the, the proportion uh, of uh, women 20 to 29 years of age that have cervical cancer, 13 year limited duration, would be 0.000093. So that is the proportion or if we think of it in terms of if we were to randomly select a woman from this particular subpopulation, then the probability that she has, uh, that we select somebody that has cervical cancer would be 0.000093. All right, among uh, uh, black or African American women uh, of this age group, then uh, the uh, prevalence is 0.0078%. That's how it's represented on the website in terms of a uh, proportion or uh, probability uh, that would, value would be 0. 0.000078. Among uh, white uh, females of that uh, in that age range, the uh, prevalence is 0. 0.0102%. All right, uh, in terms of a proportion or probability, it would be 0. 0.000102. And then uh, for the other category, the prevalence would be 0.0038% uh, and expressed as a proportion or probability that would be 0.000038. All okay, then we can use uh, the characteristics, the accuracy characteristics of the test, the sensitivity and the specificity, along with the prevalence information for uh, these various groups to come up with uh, the positive predictive value uh, that a woman has uh, cervical cancer given that her test came back positive. All right, and so again, the PPV, the positive predictive value, is the conditional probability that uh, in this case, a woman has cervical cancer given that her test came back positive. And so for uh, all races combined, the PPV would be 0.003602. For blacks or African Americans in that age range, it would be 0.00302. For whites, the PVV would be 0.00395. And for the other category, females in the, uh, uh, in the other category would be uh, 0.00148. Okay, so we can see here that uh, if we think of this from the population in general, you know, if we were randomly selecting a person uh, from that population, then these would be the values for the positive predictive value, all right? And so these uh, would be what the doctor would be uh, considering. But we also need to think about uh, the fact that uh, there is, that's, there's some selection type of bias going on here or, or potentially going on because people that are going to doctor's offices may be going there for particular reasons. They may be experiencing other uh, kinds of uh, effects and things. And so uh, we need to, uh, the doctor would obviously uh, be taking that into consideration as well. In fact, uh, the doctor would uh, be able to uh, limit uh, the actual population that a patient belongs to based on other information besides just the age range, right? The doctor would know other conditions uh, that the patient may have, other uh, things like family history. And so uh, the doctor would have additional information about the population. And within that restricted population, the prevalence values uh, may actually go up. And so the doctor, this is why, uh, you know, the doctor uh, would have uh, be able to make even more uh, finely 
or let's see, more uh, informed decisions because they are going to have more and more information about the patient than what's being described here. Okay, the negative predictive value based on uh, the sensitivity and specificity of the pap smear test along with those values for prevalence. Um, so if a, pers if a patient's uh, pap smear came back negative, then we can see here that the negative predictive value across all of these categories would be very, very high. And so if a patient's pap smear test came back negative, then uh, based on these values, uh, the doctor could be very, very confident that the person does not have cervical cancer. All right, and so this graph shows uh, for this particular test, uh, and again, the, uh, for this particular test, the sensitivity is 0 0.7580, and the specificity is 0 0.9805. And so we see here that uh, the positive predictive value um, increases very rapidly. Uh, we know that the prevalence in the real world here is very, uh, in, in this particular population, is very small. Uh, but we see here that as, uh, if we, if the doctor is using more and more information about the patient to uh, uh, refine the population uh, to which that patient belongs, then in doing that type of refinement, the uh, within that refined population, the prevalence may increase. And so we see here what happens to that positive predictive value uh, as the prevalence uh, is increasing from uh, very small values to uh, values even as uh, you know, small as 10%. Uh, um, we see that that positive predictive value increases very, very sharply. And then here is the uh, negative predictive value curve. Again, for this particular situation, for the pap smear test, and so we can see here that um, as the prevalence uh, increases, uh, uh, in you know which would be uh, determined by the uh, population or uh, refined subpopulations that the patient belongs to, uh, we see that that negative predictive value uh, decreases. And notice that the decrease for these lower ranges of prevalence values is sharper than it was what it was in our other example. All right, um, and then again, that is that is based on uh, the particular characteristics of the Pap smear test. Now we can also consider uh, some additional values associated with these outcomes. Uh, in particular, let's take a look at the conditional probability that the person does not have cervical cancer given that their test does come back positive. All right, so given that their test came back positive, what is the probability that they don't have cervical cancer? And again, these probabilities are based on no additional information other than uh, the fact that they're in that age range from 20 to 29. And so for all races combined, if a person's uh, test came back positive, the probability that they don't have cervical cancer would be 0.996. Uh, for African Americans, that probability would be 0.997. For whites, 0.996. And for uh, the other uh, group of women, 0.999. So even if a test came back positive based on this real world information, and again, not utilizing any other in, uh, um, information about the patient, uh, the probability that the person does not have cervical cancer given that the test came back positive would be uh, fairly high. But again, the physician uh, is not going to be basing their uh, assessment just on the, the age range of the patient. They're going to be using all of the information that they have available. And again, when they, when they do that, uh, that could uh, drastically um, decrease these probabilities so that uh, it would be uh, uh, less likely that the person does not have cervical cancer when their test comes back positive. So again, the, this is an illustrative example of uh, you know, how these uh, tests can be used. But again, uh, we, we need to understand that when a doctor or physician is using uh, 
uh, this information, using these tests, they're, they're, they're using much more information than we have at our disposal. And we could also consider the probability uh, that the person does have uh, cervical cancer given that their test comes back negative. And so again, this is just using um, uh, the uh, complement rule. And so you can see uh, these values. If a person's test can't, comes back negative, what's the probability that uh, the test you know, has missed uh, uh, the, the uh, I'm sorry, no, if, if the test comes back negative, what's the probability that the test comes back positive? I'm sorry, no, no, I gotta, I gotta be careful here. If the test comes back negative, what is the probability that uh, the patient actually does have cervical cancer? And again, based on just the age range information uh, and the prevalence is associated with that, uh, we see these, uh, these probabilities. Now, in reality, as we have been talking about, the physician is going to be using the, the patient's entire medical history and, and family history and so forth. And what that would do, in effect, is, is uh, 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 delimit uh, the population that the patient comes from uh, and uh, within uh, that narrower population, uh, the prevalence values may actually be quite a bit higher uh, than what they are in general for uh, the entire age range of females. And so uh, that would have a big impact on all of these values, uh, the, the positive and negative predictive values that we're calculating here. In addition, they would not rely on just a single test, a single pap smear test. Uh, typically, my understanding is, I'm obviously not a physician, uh, but uh, my understanding is that uh, more than one test is typically used, uh, the pap smear test being used first, but if that one comes back uh, positive, then they would do some additional testing. So that would be an example of the sequential uh, screen testing that we talked about in a previous lecture. All right, and uh, so uh, with that type of a testing procedure, um, if the pap smear comes back positive, uh, well, if it comes back negative, my understanding is they don't do a follow-up test, but if the pap smear comes back uh, positive, then they do an additional test, and that gives the doctor uh, more information uh, about uh, the situation. And those follow-up tests could be uh, more invasive, uh, perhaps more costly, all right, but the, the additional tests, uh, I'm told, are things like colposcopy with directed biopsies and uh, endocerv uh, endocervical couturage, uh, again, which uh, you know, could be more invasive, more costly, and so forth. But that is, you know, this is an example, a very important example of uh, the idea of a screening test, uh, trying to, you know, the, the purposes of, of the screening test are to uh, make decisions in the face of uncertainty. In this particular situation, a doctor does not uh, necessarily know uh, the actual uh, disease status of a patient when they come in, all right? He's, uh, he or she is trying to discern that through the year, uh, use of uh, uh, screening tests. Uh, and uh, so it can be a very, uh, a very complicated uh, process. And so that's the uh, end of this particular example. I think it's very interesting. And again, it's, very, it's a very important application of screening tests in the real world.